Martin Rustami SHMH, the Honorable uh, Rector of Jena University, Professor Dr. Suhaidi SHMH, the Honorable Dean of our faculty, FIPG, Dr. Zahra Husro Latifa MPDI, of course, and of course, our special guest today, Mr. Lota Visila. So you see Talo Malmi Vara PhD for special uh, from Special Education Faculty of Education University of Helsinki, Finland. Welcome to our university and all our participants today. And for the first, let's open our agenda by saying Basmala. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Let's hear the National Anthem Indonesia Raya and Juanda University Hymn. Uh, operator, please. Please. Okay.
Okay, thank you for the operator. Next, we will hear opening remarks by our Dean, Dr. Zahra Husnu Latifa, MPDI. For Dr. Zahra, please. Time is yours. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zahra? Okay, thank you. It's a technical error. Okay, thank you, Dr. Helmia Tasti Adi, for the time. Rahim, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'du. First of all, uh, of, of course, we want to thank to Allah, the Almighty God, and salawat to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him. And secondly, I would like to express my gratitude, also my high ap appreciation, to Madam uh, Lota Usitalo Malmi Fara PhD. Uh, good afternoon, Madam. Is Madam already with us? Okay, good afternoon, Madam. Good afternoon and good morning from Helsinki, Finland. Oh, yeah. We have still morning. a morning. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, good, good morning from Helsinki. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and I, uh, of course, uh, how are you today? Great, thank you. It's a great okay. pleasure to see you here online and, and it's a great privilege for me to be able to yeah. share something about Finnish education. I want to say well, welcome to you, uh, to our campus virtually, and hope that one day you can visit Indonesia in person, madam. I would love that. Yes, very much. Thank you for your kind words. And how are you today? Okay, I also want to Yes. Alhamdulillah, we are all great. We are very well, thank you. And I also want to uh, say thank to Dr. Rasmita Dila, who has initiated this program. Uh, Dr. Rasmita Dila, you still there in Helsinki? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Lotta. Don't you, don't you Good morning. Don't you miss you are so beautiful this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know then um Lotta used a shawl of batik. I gave her a batik shawl at the moment. Oh, yes. yeah, okay. lovely. <laughs> Thank you once again. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Okay. And uh, today, uh, inshallah, we would like uh, to get the term about the challenging era of educational system, learning from Finland in educational system. Because as we all know that uh, Finland becomes uh, has become one reference uh, from uh, in this in this world in the field of education compared to another country, of course. Uh, so that is why we want to learn more from Finland, madam, uh, uh, how uh, they, they manage their educational system and how it works. We want to learn uh, um, implement also in Chia in, of course, in particular in Universitas Juanda as our material evaluation for our educational system. Uh, thank you. And finally, uh, I want to say to all the participants, have a happy public lecture today. And hopefully uh, we can get uh, the expected benefits and share it with others. And thank you all. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Wallahi akulohak wa huwaya disabil. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for Dr. Zahra. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now, before we start the main agenda, let's get our virtual conversation. Operator, can you have for the screenshot, please? Okay. 
Are you ready, right? Saras, maybe Sandy. Yes. Okay. Iya bu. Di screenshot ininya foto bersamanya. Oh, siap siap bu. Hitung ya satu dua tiga. Sebentar bu. Okay. Okay everyone, open your camera and put your sweetest smile and put on. Satu, dua, tiga. Isi pertama ya bu. Ibu. Ibu. Okay, selesai. Selesai bu. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Now let's move to the main agenda. We already have our moderator for today, Dr. Rasmita Dila. How are you, Miss Mita? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely fine. Alhamdulillah. Now you look so gorgeous today, and and uh, we miss you a lot. Sounds like you are very enjoying your journey. We are waiting for you to sharing your experience in Finland. Of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. I'm so sorry. It seems like everyone caught white for our wonderful to topic today. So for Dr. Rasmi Tadila, time is yours. Okay. Thank you, um, Miss Helmi, as our. Uh, study program leader from the elementary school teacher education. For all the participants here, we have more than 100 participants. And today we have an interesting topic. Um, yeah. We invite um, my college here, Lota. Good morning, Lota. Nice to see you again. You are so beautiful this morning. Oh, thank you for your kind words. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> okay, baik. Um, teman-teman, hari ini um, kita sudah kedatangan um, speakers ya, sudah kedatangan tamu-tamu uh, tamu kita yang sangat istimewa sekali pada hari ini. Um, yang terhormat, Dekan Fakultas Agama Islam dan Pendidikan Guru, Ibu Dr. Zahra Husnul Latifah, Um, congratulations for your PhD, our Dean, dan juga kepada Ketua Program Studi uh, PGSD, Pendidikan Guru Sekolah Dasar, uh, Bu, Hel, Bu Dr. Helmi Atasti Adri, kemudian juga dosen-dosen yang sudah hadir pada pagi hari ini, waktu Helsinki dan siang hari waktu Indonesia bagian Barat, dan juga para uh, mahasiswa yang sudah hadir pada uh, ruang Zoom ini, Alhamdulillah luar biasa teman-teman sudah uh, dapat menghadiri topik atau menghadiri webinar kita pada uh, siang hari ini, dan lebih dari 100 peserta yang sudah hadir, dan ini luar biasa teman-teman sekali lagi. Jadi hari ini kita akan mendengarkan bagaimana um, akan disampaikan oleh kolega saya yang kebetulan hadir ya sudah hadir dan menyempatkan diri untuk kita dapat belajar bersama tentang bagaimana sih sistem sekolah yang ada di uh, Finland dan bagaimana uh, special educationnya kalau kita di sini menyebutkannya um, ya bisa dalam uh, special school like um, um, uh, SLB kemudian juga sebagai uh, uh, sekolah inklusif jadi uh, special education di Finland dan di Indonesia sebenarnya hampir sama teman-teman. Jadi ada yang namanya uh, sekolah khusus seperti SLB dan kemudian juga ada sekolah inklusif. Sekolah inklusif itu bisa sekolah reguler di mana di dalamnya uh, menerima siswa-siswa berkebutuhan khusus. Jadi mereka belajar bersama, nah itu namanya uh, pendidikan inklusif. Kemudian juga Lota akan uh, membicarakan tentang uh, positif pedagogi. Jadi... Uh, 
itu sangat basic sekali, sangat dasar sekali bagaimana uh, positif pedagogik itu yang kemudian harus di dipahami, dipraktekkan oleh semua guru ketika nanti mereka mengajar di sekolah dasar. Nah, ini yang kemudian akan sangat menarik sekali untuk uh, teman-teman bisa pelajari. Nanti ketika ada pertanyaan teman-teman mahasiswa atau guru di sini ya, saya yakin di sini juga ada uh, guru-guru dari luar karena memang ini dibuka untuk uh, umum. Boleh bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia boleh dituliskan di ruang uh, chat zoomnya ya teman-teman nanti atau uh, bapak ibu guru atau mungkin nanti dosen juga boleh menuliskannya tidak apa-apa kalau tidak dalam bahasa Inggris nanti saya akan uh, mentranslitkan apa yang menjadi pertanyaan dari teman-teman nah sebelum itu saya akan uh, memperkenalkan diri ya sedikit uh, untuk Lota jadi um, Lota itu uh, sebagai dosen di uh, Fakultas Pendidikan, jadi lebih tepatnya beliau uh, di uh, Faculty of Education, University of Helsinki, Finland, dan spesialisasi dari uh, Lota itu sebagai uh, lecturer of the special education, Beliau sangat uh, interest sekali sebenarnya memiliki banyak sekali hal yang dapat beliau share nanti di dalam pertemuan ini. Jadi bagaimana beliau menekankan kepada karakter strength and strength-based learning in inclusive classroom. Nah, itu adalah fokus dari LOTA. Dan LOTA juga develop positive education intervention. ya. Jadi sebagai topik dari ketika beliau menjadi mahasiswa PhD, dan tentu saja untuk special education is her specialist um, about this topic. Um, dan sebelumnya Lota ini merupakan uh, guru kelas guru-guru uh, khusus ya. Jadi kalau di Indonesia itu ada uh, guru pendamping khusus bagi siswa berkebutuhan khusus. Nah, um, Lota itu sebagai special class teacher dan um, as a subject teacher in chemistry. Jadi sangat menarik sekali, very interesting, um, dan teman-teman bisa nanti untuk memahami dan uh, bertanya ya tentang tentang topik yang beliau akan uh, share kepada kita. Lota, um, today I'm a, I am as a moderator and translator to uh, to our participant here. Maybe they are uh, there is a question that they have to. Um, or they will ask about your topic. So, um, yeah, uh, I introduce yourself. Um, uh, I introduce about what what your interest to our uh, attendees here. And I give them, I mean, for the participant that, at, uh, that if there are uh, a lot of questions, just, to ask for uh, your topic, and then they can um, do that, I mean, in Bahasa, and then I can translate uh, in English, of course, and then you can answer after you present your uh, sharing topic. So, Lota, um, we have one hour for your uh, presentation, and then we continue to the uh, question and answer. So, time is yours. Thank you once again for, for in, uh, inviting me here. Thank you, dear honored uh, Dean, all partici participants there in Indonesia, and of course, dear Rasmita Dila for, for putting this, this presentation on and, and inviting me here. Um, I will start uh, sharing my screen and my slides. Much. 
So, uh, and as Rasmita Dila just mentioned, if you have any questions, comments, if there's anything you want to know more, so please uh, raise your hand and I will give you time to, to ask. And then if there are uh, something you don't understand, perhaps Rasmita Dila can kindly uh, translate and so that we can, we can truly understand each other. So my topic today, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, is uh, Finland the happiest country in the world, but also Finnish schools, are they the best in the world? So first, where we are located. Uh, this world map is not totally in scale, so the proportions are not totally right. Finland is not that big, uh, but about 338 uh, square kilometers. Uh, but we are only 5.5 million people. So a lot of land, but not very much people. And that is uh, quite uh, important to understand. We have been a very small and homogeneous population. And that is one reason behind the success of our education. But there is a lot of a uh, lot of uh, space between Indonesia and Finland. Uh, we are on the different uh, parts of the world. However, there are very much similarities that we share. So uh, in the comparison between uh, the countries in the world, Finland has ranked number one in five years in a row. And that is a surprise to us in Finland. So if we are the happiest country in the world, what about the others? Uh, of course, there are certain, uh, certain issues that make us happy. And one of them is education. Of course, Finland has uh, the healthcare system is quite, quite good. Equality, equity, they are on a high standard. We have low uh, bureaucracy, low corruption. So some very basic political issues are, are taken well care of. Um, but then to our educational system, much of the educational success comes from a widespread reverence for teachers. We have a very good teacher education. And as we all know, it is, it is highly important. So uh, teachers are required to have a master's degree. And when talking about early childhood education, uh, the teachers should have a bachelor's degree. And all the degrees are state funded, so it is not expensive to study to become uh, a master in a subject. Of course, you have to be diligent enough to do it, but it doesn't cost a lot. Also, our pedagogical system focuses less on quantitative testing and more on experiential learning and equal opportunity for all. So we don't have very much uh, standardized tests for our students. Only one when they uh, finalize their uh, upper, uh, upper secondary education. Or there are some, some standardized testing, but not very much compared to other, other countries. Education is free for all. And I think that is the case in very many countries. However, what is quite remarkable in Finland uh, is that the national curriculum is the same for all. The basics are given by the state. And of course, this national curriculum is based, ultimately is based on political decision making. And also the scientific, um, experts uh, give their advice to uh, writing this uh, national curriculum. But also, and luckily, municipalities and individual schools can have their own modifications and they can have their own emphasis on selected subject areas. So we can have primary schools uh, that uh, stress, let's say, music teaching and learning or sports or specific languages and so on. However, private schools are very rare. Uh, the great majority of all our schools are funded by the municipalities or by the state. 
all students have right to special education services. So uh, it doesn't depend on your location. You should be able to, to receive special education services, irrespective of your hindrances, irrespective of your capabilities to learn or to, to use your, your abilities. In most cases, special education takes place in, in a mainstream class, so quite inclusively. However, we still have special classes that are located in a, in a normal, normal mainstream schools, or we also have special schools, so quite uh, separate schools uh, aimed at teaching students with more severe special educational needs. However, the policy is toward inclusion so that all students should attend their nearest mainstream school. So far, it's, uh, it doesn't uh, take place everywhere, but that is the, the direction of, of our educational policy. There is one a link if you wish to learn more about the Finnish education. So Finnish education in a nutshell. And here in this picture, you can see a pretty normal, a smallish uh, Finnish primary school. They are having their pause. Uh, we have a pause uh, after every, uh, let's say, 45 minutes, and the children spend this time outside on the schoolyard having different kind of activities, but mostly playing quite freely. And this is something that is very uh, natural in a Finnish school. All children go outside, irrespective of the weather. Sometimes the weather can be totally horrible in Finland. Just, just raining or, or snow and the mixture of, of snow and rain. But nevertheless, the children go out and have some fresh air between the lessons. And this is very important for their concentration and, of course, for their need to, to get some physical exercise also. Uh, this um, picture and this uh, or this table shows you the, the main, main lines in the Finnish education system. Uh, if you start from the bottom, first we have early childhood education and care. And every child has the right to attend early childhood education. And this is something that's very, very important in, in our nowadays policy. Every child should attend the early childhood education. And it is a subjective right of the child, not the right of the parents, but the right of the child to get good, high quality education from early on. Uh, at the age of six, pre-primary education starts. It takes one year. And during this year, the uh, teachers uh, should work quite closely with elementary school teachers in order to be able to pass the information from early childhood education to the primary classes. And in many cases, this pre-primary class is, is also physically located in the elementary school so that it's more easy. It is easier to collaborate with the teachers that will be the teachers of the child in the future. Then the comprehensive school starts at the eight, uh, age of seven and it lasts for uh, altogether nine years. First, the six years make the, the primary education and then the uh, uh, lower secondary education starts. It takes uh, normally three years. Uh, if you have problems in learning, if you have uh, what we can call also motivational problems, which are quite common when we are talking about teenagers, sometimes the school is not that tasty, so they can have an extra year after the ninth year in the lower secondary education. After that, uh, the students start the matriculation or, or the general upper secondary school, which is the academic track. And after that, they can uh, do their matriculation examination, uh, which is uh, demanded if you wish to uh, continue to universities. Or uh, you can take the vocational uh, track and uh, make a bachelor uh, 
uh, degree in, in some kind of vocational sub, uh, subject. And this is a new law in Finland, and I have written it in red. Compulsory education up to upper secondary school. This is pretty new because uh, only one year ago, uh, the uh, compulsory education stopped at the age of 16. So you only needed to go through the uh, primary and lower secondary education, and then you could do whatever you, you wanted to do. But nowadays you need to go to the general upper secondary school, the academic track or the vocational track. So all Finnish students study until the age of 18 or 19. And this is quite new and it is also quite heavily debated in Finland, whether this is a good decision or not, because we also have some students in the general upper secondary school who do not have the motivation or even the skills to study the academic uh, subjects. However, also the vocational track might be uh, too hard a, of a demand for them. But of course, it is better to have the students in a school than on the streets, to put it together. After that, um, uh, you can, uh, well, sorry, I, I said it a bit like uh, in a misleading way. Uh, after um, finishing the vocational track in the upper secondary school, then you can apply to the bachelor's degree. Of course, it comes after this. Uh, upper secondary school. It is uh, one track or the other one is the university track uh, where you can you can uh, become a bachelor or a master in a subject such as education or special education or whatever it might be. And then of course you can do your, your uh, licensure degree which is pretty uh, rare nowadays. Most of our our students after the master's level take the doctoral degree. But uh, if you choose the bachelor uh, degree in uh, universities of applied sciences, if you are following the so-called vocational track, it is not a dead end for your academic studies. You can also apply for further studies after you have worked for two years in your own field. So um, I think this is a great decision for all students. You don't have to know at the age of 15 or 18 what you will become, but you can choose on also later on. So both tracks are, are open for all our students. OK, I think that at this point I will make a short pause if you have anything to ask, if there's anything that you wonder or want to know more, so please raise your hand and you can also ask Rasmit Tadila to, to translate or, or, or to, to make, make it more precise. So please, if you have anything on your mind. Okay, uh, maybe we have uh, two or three questions here, Lota in the chat zoom um okay from or maybe we can uh, you can continue uh, your presentation first and then uh, maybe uh, at the end of your presentation okay. the attendees uh, can ask about the question that they will ask okay that's fine uh -huh. all right thank you okay then some background and i think it is highly highly uh, important to uh, explain something about our educational background because uh, sometimes people come to Finland and they wonder what are we doing in a different way because our school days are not very long the uh, amount of uh, homework is not very very big and so so where do our good results come from and you cannot go without saying something about the history. Mikhail Agrigola was a priest uh, in Finland about 500 years ago. And uh, those days, 
there was no written Finnish language. Uh, Finland was part of Sweden and most of the uh, administral texts or all of them were in, in Swedish because fin Finnish language did not exist. But this man uh, really founded the written Finnish language. And we are great, uh, very grateful for him because he invented a very transparent language. Finnish language is very easy to read because every letter is pronounced the same way. Same way when uh, uh, corresponding to their uh, uh, letter. So the letter phoneme correspondence is almost total. So um, graphemes and phonemes uh, are very, very like easy to understand. And he also wrote the first ABC book in Finnish. And of course, those days, only the religious books were allowed and were read in Finland. So he also translated the New Testament of Bible in Finnish. But this was really important for, for the start of the Finnish school. Uh, about 100 years uh, later, even more, something more uh, important came up. One bishop named Johannes Geselius uh, was very um, decisive in saying that every family should be able to learn something about the, the holy texts of God. And uh, uh, he said that uh, every people, uh, every person should see with their own eyes what God commands and demands in his sacred word. And the second point says it all. He wanted to carry out a program of reform to make the whole country literate. But there were many complications, no books. So this guy started writing and publishing text books. And he organized reading examinations. And can you imagine for all people in Finland, those days in the 17th century, we were only about 300,000 people. So that's not a lot. However, it was a big, big endeavor to make every house literate. Uh, and it was really a big stress for all common people to, to show how much reading they could manage. And there's an old picture in the, the uh, left corner showing how it, how it went. Every person uh, should show their reading skills. And it was recorded and it was put in, in documents to show if, if people were able to read. But also it was a great day of celebration uh, when people came together and had a party after this uh, stressful reading examination. Uh, the church law in 1648 said that people were not allowed to get engaged unless they were able to read some catechismus, a part of, of the Holy Bible. So the motivation was there. People were not able to get married unless they could read. They could not raise a family if they could not, not read. So this really was the starting point for the Finnish school. They were really motivated to learn. And in every small village, there were some persons who were the, the first teachers. And they, the, these first teachers went from house to house to teach other people of, of the Finnish language and, and of, of reading, at least something, because otherwise you could not get married. But uh, in the end of the 19th uh, century, the first act of primary education came into power and the so-called folks schools started. And in 1921, the act on compulsory education started and there's a picture of a Finnish class from those days. And as you can see, all girls, all boys went to school together. And uh, on the rural sites of Finland, of course, most of, of Finland, there were no big cities those days. But uh, sometimes it was difficult to organize a real school on the most rural, uh, rural parts of the, of the country. But they started and they tried to do their best 
and that's how our, our school started. Well, in the 60s and 70s, the structural change took place. It kind of, uh, I dare to say, ho horrible big buildings were built and the first suburbs were formed outside of our big cities and a very rapid migration from the countryside to the cities started. Also, a school reform took place and uh, one of the great, great changes those days was that there was no early division on the academic or vocational track. That was before this big structural change and this big school change in the 70s. Those days also the part-time special education started. So in every school there was a special education teacher that uh, took children, took students out of their classes, to teach them separately in small clinics. Sometimes the special education teacher went to the mainstream classes and taught together with the uh, normal teacher, normal class teacher, but it was more common that the students went to a specific small room to start uh, learning in a, a bit different way with a special teacher. And this kind of system still exists in Finland we have a special education teachers that have their own clinics inside of schools and special education is also delivered in this kind of clinic model. So as I just mentioned, Finland has been very homogeneous, meaning that we have been very similar. It is, I know that it's something that is totally different from Indonesia, but we have been a very homogeneous population. The first refugees uh, came to Finland in the 70s and nowadays, of course, there is more heterogeneity in the Finnish population and about 8.5% of the Finnish people come from other countries or have their backgrounds from elsewhere than Finland. So we have, we have also some variety in our ethnical backgrounds nowadays too. But I think it's really, really salient to, to see that our history stems from a very, very similar group of people and only a small number of people. And that's how uh, our educational system also evolved. And then um, something about our special education system. So uh, before the school reform in, in the 70s, special education services were mainly delivered to the hearing or visual impaired and also for the mentally retarded and often uh, in, in specific medical institutes. Um, and in most cases, schools and classes existed for uh, two special groups, those who had severe learning uh, disabilities and for those who be behaved in a disturbing way. So two kind of special classes existed when I first started my school career in the 70s. There were classes for, for those who were really bad, really bad mannered and very like acting very in a very disturbing way. And then there were specific classes for those who were slow learners, but nothing else. And well, of course, we had this clinic kind of model, but inclusion did not exist. Today in Finland, we have a three level system. Every student is eligible for general support. So if you're struggling in your learning, you should be given general support in your own classroom without any documentation or without any uh, like a heavy, uh, bureaucracy. It is a low threshold support. If that is not enough, you can be given intensified support. And that means that you have the right to receive more special educational services inside the same classroom, in your own classroom. You are not like transferred to any other places, but you are in your own classroom, but you have more uh, rights to give uh, to be given uh, like um, 
different kind of tasks, more time to do your exams, and uh, all kinds of modifications that are possible in a normal classroom. But then we also have this uh, special support level. If the general support level or the intensified support level, if they are not enough, you can be given special support. And according to our inclusive policy, also the special support should be given in your own classroom. But in some cases, you can be transferred or you can be recommended to, to attend a special class uh, that is specialized in certain kind of more severe uh, challenges in your learning or in your behavior. So special classes still exist. Um, I think this graph shows a lot. Um, here you can see the bars of all students in the Finnish comprehensive school. So starting from the grade one to and, and finishing in, in the grade nine. Uh, in blue, uh, the students who receive special support are shown. And in orange, you can see the people who receive intensified support. And as you can see, in 2011, the new legislation uh, came into power. This intensified level of support was introduced in order to limit the number of students in special education. So intensified support came to uh, compensate or, and also to replace the older system. But what has happened? As you can see, the number of students in intensified support level and also in special support level has really increased. It increases all the time. And if we uh, put here the newest statistical data, we could see that it's still growing. So what we can see about this system, there is inflation. It's, it doesn't work because it does not make sense that this many of our students get support. There should be something done in the basic level because this is like, like it's, it looks like we all have some, or, or all of our students have some kind of like, like biggish problems. But this is the, the case it is nowadays. Of course, you can also see the brighter picture and you can figure it out in the way that we have done it very well because so many of our students can be given support. So it is a two, like two-sided picture. However, this is quite remark remarkable that the number of students is growing. And there are many reasons behind of this fact. Of course, the heterogeneity is, is one, of, one of the reasons. Okay, and then I'm quite happy if I have, have some time to share something about my own research. And as Rasmita Dila kindly introduced, my speciality lies in positive education. Originally, I made my PhD in learning difficulties, in reading difficulties, and that was in 2009 when I finished my PhD. But since then, I have been working mainly in the field of positive psychology and positive pedagogy and positive education. Uh, here you can see three uh, our quite new uh, or some of uh, some of uh, our newest uh, publications, which my PhD student Kaisa Borinen, who finished her PhD last uh, spring. Uh, she's the, the first author in these three articles, and they all tap um, special education in the positive education, from the positive education angle. So we have been trying to uh, develop interventions where all the positive sides of our special education students uh, should be uh, addressed. And we have developed uh, character strength interventions, and also we have been teaching character strengths to teachers and to teacher educators. Um, 
So, and um, something about the positive education, the main idea is to focus on what works well. Uh, and this is to complement the traditional way of only trying to see the challenges and the problems and how we can ameliorate and how we can help in problems. Of course, we should help in problems and we should support our students if they are struggling. But at the same time, we should see what is well working in every student, because irrespective of the challenges and problems, there are good sides, there are in the, and there are well working sides, potential skills, capabilities in every student. And this is something that needs to be emphasized, because sometimes the problems overshadow the whole personality and we only see the dark side of a student and of course that is something that never should be done to a child or to a young people or not to an adult either so the strengths should be made visible in every student and also in every teacher and one of the main learnings is that not everyone needs to do or learn the same we should differentiate quite a lot and we should be brave enough to give different kind of teaching to different kind of students for their benefits. Uh, in order to give our students chances to succeed, if we are given the same to every student, well, we can be sure that not everyone is successful. And of course, we want to see our students to succeed. And as these two pics illustrate it in a very nice way, what is equality on the left-hand side? Well, it's not the same with equity. So everyone should be given a chance to succeed. And in this case, to, in this, uh, case, to enjoy the football match. Um, one of our main um, issues and main uh, one of our main foci has been to document the successful moments. Sometimes in the rush of daily school life, we have no time to stop at the spots where the students succeed. So we should put more effort on those golden moments and we should document them more precisely and in detail. And also this, um, and furthermore, these moments of, of success don't have to be very big, but they have to be something concrete so that we can write on, on a paper, we can put black on white to show that this student is successful. They can be very minor occasions, but we need to document them because otherwise we may get a picture of a student with special needs where only the challenges and the problems and the struggling are visible. So we should put equal amount of effort in showing what is good and well working in a documentative way, so that it's not something that is superficial or, or extra, but it should weight as much as the problems. And of course, we should be very diligent and very active in showing to parents and, and other teachers, everything that our students do well. So recognizing and using your own skills and strengths leads to successes. Furthermore, being successful promotes your self-esteem and self-efficacy beliefs. And naturally, if your self-esteem is on a high level, and if your self-efficacy beliefs, especially in learning, are a good enough level, you learn more. And both self-esteem and self-efficacy beliefs are highly related to well-being. And we know that the uh, students who are doing well, who are feeling well, who are happy, they learn best. They have the best chances to benefit from teaching and they know how to use their skills in order to learn more and what is most important is that they dare to learn they dare to be curious they dare to ask 
because their uh, self-esteem is good enough. And self-esteem rises from successful moments. So there is a circle that works in a beautiful way if we only put more emphasis on successful moments. And there's a lot of scientific data backing up these assumptions. So this is a structural equation model uh, coming from our own studies. So uh, starting from the left side, usage of strengths. If the students are able to use their strengths, they know where they are good at. Their study engagement increases. So they are more engaged, they enjoy their studying more. And also their school related happiness increases. That means that they feel good in school, especially their social relationships flourish in school, if they can use their strengths. And all of these three factors, they contribute to their general happiness. If they can use their strengths, if they are engaged in studying, and if they feel happy in school. I think it's quite like intrinsically easy to understand that the general happiness is on a high level if these three factors work well. But also, it works the other way around. If we started from general happiness, from this right hand side factor, it is also true. So this equation could be like driven from uh, right to left. Those students who are already happy, their study engagement is on a high level. They feel happy also, or they more more likely feel happy in their school life, and also they are able to use their strengths. So it is a, a two-way process. But what we can do as teachers and as teacher educators, we can promote the usage of strengths by teaching what strengths and especially what character strengths are. And we can teach how to use your strengths in order to be successful in your schoolwork. And this has been really the core of, of my, my teaching and my philosophy and my research now for, for more than, than one decade. I find it very rewarding and also something that is very much needed in the school life, especially when we are, when we are facing students with big, big uh, problems and challenges. Okay. Um, I'm almost at the end of, of my uh, lecture. And so I want to share this, these nice words from uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu. It is familiar to all of us that we start to flourish when we are with people who see the good in us. And we know how we start to wilt when we are with people who only see our faults. I think this, this nicely summarizes what is meant by positive education and, and positive teaching and about the uh, character strength approach. We are trying to see what is best, what is flourishing, what are the best seeds in every student and also in every teacher. What are the seeds that need to be flourished in addition to trying to help in problems? Positive education does not mean that we should like be blind for problems or to, to say that, okay, there are no challenges because of course we are facing a lot of challenges all the time, but it does not pay off to only try to support in problems. At the same time, the, the brightest points need to be polished and they should be given more room. Okay, I'm coming to the end of, of my slideshow. I'm thanking you very much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I truly hope that I can sometimes uh, someday see you in person and come to Indonesia. I would love to share these ideas and about this uh, strength-based teaching also with you. And now I'm, I'm ready for your questions and comments and we can perhaps dwell a bit uh, more deeply in, in the subject. 
uh, here you can see myself. Uh, this is uh, last winter. I'm trying to make a hole in the ice. To Thank, get you. Some Thank you. And uh, so this is how it looks like on <laughs> our and, and oh, on. Uh, on on the sea, this is a seaside in front of Helsinki, quite near close to to our faculty, so that the weather can be quite quite different from yours. So terima kasih, and thank you for your attendance. Now it's time for for your questions. Okay, thank you, Lotta, for your uh, very important. Um, sharing insight about the topic today. And we have any questions here? Okay. Wow. Okay, for the first question is from... Um, wait. From Ali Kusumadinata. Mm -hmm. And the question is... Um, how about the goals of education in Finland? Is it written in the uh, written in the law, just something like uh, regulation from the government, and maybe uh, for the municipalities that they have to adjust the education or uh, education system? I mean, uh, from the from the regulation or of the law, or something like that. Um, and how is the management of education managed by the private sector and the government as well? Yes. Sarif, bisa di mute dulu, Sarif. Sarif, bisa di mute peserta? Indah, indah. Ya, um, mohon teman-teman. Uh, yang sedang mengikuti Zoom supaya untuk bisa di unmute dulu karena memang kita masih dalam uh, proses uh, apa proses uh, untuk memahami ya jadi uh, untuk bisa di mute terlebih dahulu karena memang perbedaan waktu jadi mohon harap maklum ya oke okay, Lota that the first question yes uh, how Thank about you. the regulation I mean uh, regulation of the goal of education in Finland is there a regulation just like a law from the government and how to adjust for the municipalities that they have to make uh, their own regulation for each the municipalities okay yes thank you for the question yes there are goals there are learning goals and they are given by the government of by the uh, educational authorities and it is we have a basic law for education that stipulates the uh, the basic frame for all teaching in all school levels in addition to that we have uh, municipality regulated laws and of course learning goals mm -hmm. and the national core curriculum that is really something that we need to obey everywhere in finland it says the learning goals for every school level in the early childhood education the goals are given in the early childhood education part then in pre-primary education there are certain goals we need to meet this uh, or we, we need to strive toward to reach these goals and of course in primary and in secondary schools there are also goals the state uh, written um, core curriculum the national core curriculum is something that cannot be overruled we need to obey it but municipalities have their own goals as well so they can a bit adjust their own goals but overall the national level is there mm -hmm. okay ya jadi pak ali um, finland itu mereka memiliki uh, regulasi juga ya seperti kita juga di indonesia jadi mereka punya hukum uh, bagaimana sistem pendidikan itu dibuat nah untuk setiap daerah biasanya mereka tetap sebagai standarnya itu mengikuti uh, regulasi atau hukum yang tertulis di dalam uh, perundang-undangan itu. Jadi um, tetap harus mengikuti sebagai standar dasarnya pendidikan. Kemudian di Finland juga mereka mempunyai kurikulum nasional, sama seperti kita. Mereka punya kurikulum nasional dan setiap provinsi, setiap daerah, mereka mengikuti core-nya, mengikuti basic dari kurikulum nasional itu, tapi itu bisa dikembangkan 
oleh setiap daerah. Jadi di sini memang kuat sekali untuk daerah itu bisa diberikan otoritas untuk bisa mengembangkan kurikulum. Nah dari um, daerah itu biasanya setiap sekolah itu bisa mengembangkan kurikulumnya juga. Jadi disesuaikan dengan kebutuhan uh, sekolahnya masing-masing. Tapi itu tidak tidak keluar dari koridor uh, kurikulum nasional mereka. Jadi um, mereka diberi keleluasaan untuk setiap daerah, kemudian untuk sekolah juga mereka juga diberikan keleluasaan untuk mengembangkan kurikulum sesuai dengan uh, kebutuhan mereka. Oke, okay, um, for the next question, Lota. Um, Oke, okay, this question is from oh Arif Shah. I think uh, he is from the Arabic language education program. Um, how to apply teaching materials to the student in Finland, and what is the difficulty of a teacher in teaching students there? So how to apply the teaching materials? Yeah. Um, well, there is no difficulty in applying the teaching materials because in, in most cases, if you mean teach by teaching materials, you mean school books mm -hmm. and, or, and uh, also digital materials. It's not difficult because the, uh, the school book uh, publishers, they uh, know the core curriculum, the national core curriculum, and the books and all the digital materials Nowadays, we use a lot of digital teaching materials. They are made and developed based on the rules and based on what is said in the core curriculum. So they go, go totally hand in hand. So there is no difficulty in, in adjusting the materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jadi Arif, uh, Arif Shah ya dari PBA. Jadi guru itu nggak ada kesulitan ketika mereka harus mengajarkan uh, Uh, apa bahan ajar gitu ya atau mendapatkan bahan ajar di Finland itu bahan ajar itu banyak sekali uh, baik secara digital maupun secara textbook nah jadi uh, mereka guru-guru ini sangat mudah untuk mendapatkan bahan ajar dan mengajarkannya itu kepada siswa juga mereka sampai saat ini um, tidak ada kesulitan ya baik itu akses maupun ya mungkin ketika mengajarkan kepada maha, uh, kepada siswa mungkin ada Kesulitan-kesulitan itu lebih kepada bagaimana mereka harus bisa um, membedakan atau mem membedakan dalam artian uh, siswa itu memiliki uh, kebutuhannya mana. Jadi memiliki kebutuhan ataupun cara belajarnya berbeda. Itu saja yang mungkin nanti uh, di dalam kelas harus guru pikirkan. Dan ini juga yang saya lihat di dalam kelas-kelas uh, SD ya, uh, khususnya di Finland kemarin. Nah, Okay, um, we move to uh, the next question. Okay, Lota, is there a just like a school superintendent um, in Finland, and what is uh, the role for the superintendent? Just like maybe for just like a supervisor, maybe for the school, or yeah, we come in with the superintendent, maybe in yeah. Finland, is there no. No, we don't have that kind of persons. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it's only in every school there is one principal, mm -hmm. so the head teacher, and um, he or she is responsible for almost everything in the school. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are vice, like vice presidents in the school, and teams that are responsible for certain uh, areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, no, that kind of super supervisor. No, the principals are directly. Um, are responsible for their schools and they uh, uh, give reports to the um, municipality um, municipality leaders or if the municipality is very great in a, a certain area uh, educational area um, how could we get a board it, you can call it a board educational board so the uh, their <clears throat> principles, Uh, report to these educational boards in the municipalities, but not this kind of like superintendent. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, jadi ini ada yang um, private message ke saya. <coughs> jadi yang uh, apa namanya di Finland itu mereka tidak punya superintendent. Jadi nggak punya uh, pengawas sekolah itu mereka nggak punya. 
Jadi setiap sekolah itu langsung uh, mereka uh, dengan kepala sekolahnya itu um, yang yang langsung bertanggung jawab itu ke ada badannya sendiri di uh, kabupaten atau kota Madia. Jadi mereka nggak punya kayak kita yang seperti pengawas sekolah mereka nggak punya mereka basisnya adalah kepercayaan. Jadi sekolah itu memang nanti langsung bertanggung jawab atau berkewajiban untuk um, apa bagaimana kemajuan sekolah itu memang ada badannya langsung di uh, daerah ya seperti di kabupaten maupun di kota Madia. Jadi mereka nggak punya pengawas sekolah gitu seperti kita yang harus diawasin gitu. Oke, okay. I think this is um, uh, a good question too. How about the learning teacher teaching and learning during the pandemic COVID-19, Lota? I think this is um, the big problem for all the school around the world. So how yes. about the, uh, uh, in the Finnish about uh, this question? Yes, thank you. It, it really, really was, was a bad time for all of us. In Finland, there was no total lockdown. So um, only for a couple of weeks when the pandemic first broke, uh, almost all schools were closed, but not the schools for the youngest ones and not the schools for the students who are having special educational needs because um, our authorities thought that it would be even worse if these students would stay at home compared to the, the risks they would be facing in school. So that the smallest kids went to school through the pandemic and also the students with severe special needs. The other ones, especially the older students, were in distant learning. They stayed at homes. The, uh, there was hybrid teaching. Some of the students uh, could uh, go to classrooms, but in most cases they stayed at home and the teachers were, were teaching online. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, it didn't work out very well, uh, especially in the beginning. Um, and we know that uh, loneliness, depression, anxiety, and these kind of challenges have grown after the yeah, during and after the pandemic because the youth has been very lonely and and really really uh, just facing their their screens in their homes also the learning learning results have decreased mm -hmm. jadi selama pandemik ya uh, di Finland itu tidak totally lockdown jadi memang uh, apa namanya mereka sangat sebentar banget jadi pas waktu awal-awal pandemi Uh, mereka tidak lockdown semua seperti di beberapa negara, termasuk di kita kan seperti ada di PKKM gitu ya, ada level-levelnya. Kalau di Finland, mereka uh, ketika uh, wabah COVID-19 itu mulai merebak, mereka hanya sebentar saja uh, untuk lockdownnya, dalam artian itu pun tidak lockdown secara full, totally lockdown. Jadi, uh, uh, masalah ini sebenarnya uh, hampir sama di Indonesia. Anak-anak yang Um, masuk ke dalam PAUD, kemudian SD, dan um, hampir di semua level pendidikan itu merasakan sekali bagaimana uh, pembelajaran itu menjadi sangat uh, tidak tidak sesuai gitu ya. Artinya um, mereka tetap melaksanakan ada yang seperti kita lakukan seperti hybrid, seperti blended learning campuran, kadang-kadang daring, kadang-kadang luring gitu. Nah tapi setelah itu mereka mengevaluasi lagi bahwa Um, banyak sekali masalah-masalah yang kemudian ini harus dilaksanakan pembelajaran ini secara da, uh, secara luring seperti sekarang ini mereka sudah luring karena memang uh, seperti orang-orang uh, banyak kebanyakan dari uh, para ya seperti kita lah ya um, uh, pernah terjadinya depresi, kemudian kesendirian, kemudian kecemasan yang berlebihan, itu membuat tidak nyaman bagi semua orang. Jadi pada akhirnya pembelajaran itu dilaksanakan, mereka mengevaluasi lagi dan uh, pembelajaran itu dilaksanakan secara luring kalau untuk sekarang. Tapi memang sistemnya sama seperti kita. Sebelumnya mereka juga uh, hybrid learning, jadi memang uh, ada daring, dan ada juga luring. Jadi sebenarnya hal ini hampir sama lah di Indonesia dilakukan gitu. Oke, okay. 
And actually we have um, so many questions here, uh, Lota, but I think I have to choose what is the relevant and, and maybe um, the student or a participant here wants to know about the globally or maybe specific uh, focus of the question. Oh, um, are there any uh, just like a vocational program school in Finland? And is it possible for a person with, uh, I mean, a student with a disability to attend the school? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. A very important question. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, students uh, with disabilities can and they should attend a vocational school. Uh, the learning goals um, may, um, may be very practical, but anyway, they should be learning a profession and there are specific vocational schools for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Ya, jadi uh, di Finland itu uh, punya ya vocational school atau uh, sekolah kayak SMK gitu ya atau yang yang sederajatnya dan semua siswa di Finland uh, sebenarnya untuk semua level pendidikan mereka uh, siswa berkebutuhan khusus itu boleh dan memang harus masuk Uh, maksudnya bisa ya masuk ke dalam uh, sekolah uh, kejuruan seperti itu dan mereka sangat diterima dengan baik. Oke, okay. maybe this is for the last question Lota. Oke. Okay. Um, ya, yeah, oke. Okay. Um, this question is from I think from oke. Okay. Um, the question is Finland um, You know, like um, uh, have a principle, uh, have a principle, just uh, education for all, uh, justice for all, to go to the school, and avoid the um, uh, the management of school that are oriented toward competition. Just, just, just like to is it is it true, or how to manage the school that uh, we are in the same collaboration uh, with a good atmosphere? It's it is something like that, Lota. Okay, if I understood correctly, uh, you are asking how to like put together, as you said, competition? No, I think um, in Finland, uh, there is a statement that the uh, uh, participant uh, written about the statement that Finland avoid the competition for yes, the, stu the, yes. the student. Yes. Yeah, avoid yes. the competition that yes. that maybe there are like a collaborate collaboration each student that they can reach the goal of the learning is something like that. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it, it it really is one of our main goals that we should be collaborative and not like competing against each mm -hmm. other. Uh, so uh, the processes and group works, team learning is really underlined and it is really highly appreciated in our schools and also in our teacher education. We are trying to teach our st the student teachers the ways of teaching where collaboration is in, in the heart of teaching. So when we, are, when we are learning something, it should be like uh, learning for the whole group and not not just for one, one individual. However, mm -hmm. of course, there is competition, uh, especially at the end of the upper secondary school, because there we have this standardized testing and very much based on these tests, you can apply to universities. And it, it is a very individual and very traditional, and I dare to say it is very old fashionable, this testing method. But mm -hmm. during the school years, competition is, is avoided, or at least we are trying to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I have uh, one question. I mean, I want to continue from your statement that about the, the assessment, it is something um, test maybe, because there is a competition that you mentioned for the upper, uh, upper secondary school, but for the... Um, a primary or maybe early childhood system, there is no assessment or test for each of the student, right? Well, uh, we do have some tests and uh, we do give uh, grade numbers and uh, we do count these grade point averages. 
but mm -hmm. only starting at the age of 10 or so to avoid excess competition and also in order to give a more fair assessment and evaluation because just giving a letter or a number it doesn't say a lot so there there is sometimes uh, or there should be qualitative assessment mm -hmm. so some kind of written text about every student to like truly and honestly and in a more many-sided way to describe what the student how the student is developing and what are her or his uh, like the uh, the uh, best learning outcomes mm -hmm. and also the, I, the challenges mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why i asked it to you about that because uh, it's contrary in indonesia uh, the teacher always do the test or assessment for all the subjects it's it's contrast with Indonesia then that you explained that the teacher here only uh, do the test test I mean uh, assessment it's test maybe uh, it's only letter or written number is something like that so this is very important informa information to the teacher what is they have to do about the test to the uh, other to the students here jadi teman teman uh, bapak ibu di Finland itu tidak ada tes secara khusus seperti kita akhir semester yang semua mata pelajaran itu dites di bawah usia 18 tahun ya dalam artian untuk yang basic education. Jadi di sini dari mulai TK, TK SD lah ya, SD ketika untuk naik kelas mereka tidak ada tes untuk seperti kita di akhir semester itu paling mereka hanya melihat mengevaluasi mereka sudah sampai mana. Kemudian juga tes itu paling juga ada membaca dan berhitung saja. Jadi tidak semua mata pelajaran. Nah, dan terkait dengan yang pertanyaan tadi tentang yang kompetisi atau katakanlah kompetisi di antara siswa atau sekolah, mereka lebih mengedepankan kerjasama or collaboration. Jadi uh, kerjasama dalam kelompok-kelompok kecil, kemudian uh, akan ada kompetisi itu ketika mereka sudah tamat SMA, karena mereka harus masuk ke universitas. Jadi untuk masuk ke universitas mana, mereka harus uh, kompetisi dalam artian tes gitu ya, seperti kita juga misalnya SBMPTN gitu. Nah, tapi di bawah itu di bawah untuk SMA, SD, SMP, basic education lah gitu atau primary education mereka tidak melakukan tes semua siswa itu hanya dievaluasi secara kualitatif jadi mereka sejauh mana pencapaiannya jadi tidak ada rapot yang ini harus nggak naik kelas gitu ya atau atau naik kelas dengan skornya berapa jadi mereka sebenarnya nggak punya bukan nggak punya maksudnya tidak tidak menentukan misery learningnya itu atau KKM lah seperti kita itu di, di top, dipatok itu berapa gitu skor skornya jadi memang ya kalau kita bandingkan memang agak berat ya artinya pada akhir semester kita harus tahu nih skor KKM-nya berapa gitu nah sementara di sana mereka hanya tes itu untuk huruf saja membaca dan berhitung itu yang mereka lakukan di Finlandia. Oke, okay, uh, teman-teman, saya pikir ini sudah jam 11 lebih. Lota, I think um, the time is over. Or maybe you have uh, any statement or uh, any statement or maybe what do you want to um, show or maybe want to talk about, discuss further about uh, the topic. Thank with you. Thank our, you once uh, again. Is here. Yes. Uh, I'm, I feel very grateful for this this morning or your afternoon there, and thank mm -hmm. you for your interest. I'm happy to see that you are so many, more than 250 participants. It's really been a great, great, great pleasure and also an honor for me to to share these these insights about the Finnish education with you. And I, from from the bottom of my heart, I wish that that we have the chance to meet in person and and continue on these topics. If I, 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 I should like summarize uh, what I have been learning as a teacher in, during my career is, it is that happy children learn best. So well-being comes first, then comes the learning, first the well-being. 
So let's try to to emphasize and promote the well-being in our students, and of course, of course, in you as teachers and as teacher students. So thank you once again, and I'm happy to also share the slides with you, so I can perhaps send them to Rasmita Dila, who can who can share them further to you. So thank you and take care. Bye bye. Thank Dalila. you, Lotta. Nice to see you. Thank you for the fruitful sharing insight today. Okay. Uh, Oke. Okay. Uh, jadi teman-teman kita sudah mendapatkan banyak sekali uh, apa pemahaman ya tentang apa yang disampaikan oleh Lotta bahwa di Finlandia itu sistem pendidikannya mereka menerapkan uh, sekolah yang bahagia gitu. Jadi sekolah yang bahagia itu adalah bagaimana kekuatan-kekuatan yang mere, yang yang kita miliki gitu ya seperti eh, bagaimana caranya guru itu mengajar lebih bahagia bagaimana kebahagiaan itu untuk siswa juga ha, harus mereka berikan dalam artian bagaimana metode metode pembelajarannya yang mereka rancang dan ini juga yang saya alami ketika mengunjungi sekolah dasar di di Helsinki dan nanti minggu depan saya akan ke Yiva sekolah juga untuk melihat bagaimana di SD mereka jadi di sana memang benar-benar uh, setiap siswa itu diharapkan mereka dapat mengikuti pembelajaran itu dengan baik tanpa ada tekanan no pressure to the students. Jadi how about the happiness and they can increase the happiness to each the student. Mereka bisa meningkatkan kebahagiaan kepada setiap apa setiap siswa gitu ya. Nah, ini yang menjadi keunggulan dan menjadi hebatnya sistem pendidikan di Finlandia. Oke, okay. terima kasih teman-teman, Bapak Ibu yang sudah hadir pada webinar pada uh, siang menjelang sore hari ini. Once again, thank you Lota uh, for your uh, experience and the presentation today. I hope that we can meet again for another time. And of course, the collaboration between um, lecturer here, uh, collaboration in research, of course, too. Oke, okay, terima kasih teman-teman atas kehadirannya pada sore hari ini dan uh, pada pagi hari ini waktu Helsinki. Terima kasih Bu Kaprodi yang sudah memberikan kesempatan ini. Uh, selamat siang, wallahu yakulul haq, wallahu yadi sabil. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan jangan lupa teman-teman, ibu-ibu uh, bisa mengisi absennya yang sudah di-share oleh Syarif. Uh, supaya juga nanti dapat sertifikatnya. Saya kembalikan lagi kepada Ibu Kaprodi yang sudah hadir kembali. Silakan. Oke, okay. um, untuk itu Buka Prodi mungkin sedang ada kegiatan juga ya. Uh, terima kasih teman-teman semua. Uh, salam dari Helsinki. Mudah-mudahan pada Helsinki. awal bulan November saya uh, sudah bisa hadir kembali di Indonesia. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye Lota. Lota. Miss Mita, I'm so sorry. I have something here before.